I went to search Leroy's friend um, and my colleague went to search Leroy. And as I went to move over, um, I saw Leroy pull a handgun out of his waist. And then uh, Leroy pointed a gun at me and told me to disappear. And literally as I've turned and Leroy's fired a, another shot, which um, hit me about a centimetre from my spine, went through the top of my kidney and out my side. All I wanted to do was escape. If I don't get away and the rest of the police come, I'm dead for sure. I grew up in South London, Clapham. I grew up with my grandmother and my uncles and aunties. My mother got murdered when I was two. I was uh, born in a village in Kent, a village called Paddockwood. Um, came from a very religious background. My dad was a Baptist minister, so um, the way we were brought up was literally by the Ten Commandments. Obviously, I wanted to um, fit in with my, my friends. Um, and I just wanted to get a job as soon as I can. I had good opportunities. I went to a very good school. I didn't make the most of those opportunities. And I left at 16, um, just worked in a factory to get a job and get some money. And I just wanted to get a car and have a girlfriend. <laughs> so um, that's what I did. I decided I wanted to... Um, move out of home and um, do something different in life. And that's why I joined the police. My early years, all of my peers were street people, armed robbers and drug dealers. I left school when I was 13 and started smoking cannabis and dealing with petty crime and it just escalated from there. So I started doing street robberies and then burgling in the countryside instead of locally. And then this led to coming across shotguns and firearms. And then those started to be used to do robberies. I got moved to Brixton from South Nord. It was um, similar crime, but it was going on a uh, higher volume in a much smaller area. And the open drug dealing, um, yeah, it went on in South Nord, but it wasn't as open as it was in Brixton. Literally the hatred towards police, it wasn't a dislike, it was, it was, it was almost a hatred that you felt. Was it scary? Um, I think policing can be scary wherever you work, um, but certainly the, the confrontation um, was greater than where I'd worked before. I remember um, when something had happened uh, between the black community and the police, and we got sent onto this uh, estate, just literally just to go and check out a stolen car that had been recovered. And it was basically a set up for us to get um, attacked. Yeah, about a hundred people like surround us and started throwing missiles towards the car. Um, front windscreen got totally damaged. Um, but um, we, we were quite lucky, really, because a lot of reinforcements were close by. And Leroy, on the flip side of that, um, growing up, what was your kind of perspective on the police? From early, we had a bad outlook towards police because you're ingrained in that society. You're, you're, it's ingrained in you from early not to trust police. One time, one of my cousins, I remember when I'd done a burglary and I was wanted and police came to my house and the whole house said, I'm not, I'm not in. Even my granddad's an old man and he knows to say, he's not here, what do you want? Yeah? And one of my little cousins, he just didn't know no better, innit? And he said, you're looking for Leroy? And the policeman said, yeah. He said, he's a naughty, he's naughty, ain't he? He's in the cupboard, he's in the wardrobe. And he ran to the, I opened the door and I said, shut up. And it was too late, you understand? The policeman came in and I got arrested. And I kept, from then I called him a grass because I just couldn't help it because it's ingrained on you. So one of my uh, young people what was around me at the time, I sent him to Brixton to go and collect some money from someone who was a friend who had a couple of thousand pounds for me for drugs what I'd laid onto him. And 
I gave him some more to give to the person. He went there, gave them more drugs and didn't collect the money. It wasn't an issue. The guy weren't going to rob me or nothing, but that's not what I told him to do. And I was a bit pissed off. So when he came back and he didn't have the money, I decided to go there myself and got my friend to take me on the back of his bike. So I jumped on the back of my friend's bike and we flew down to Brixton. I was on a late shift. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Normal late shift, always busy. Um, I was with a younger colleague and um, we decided that uh, we could do with a little bit of overtime, which was so easy to get. And one of the places we went to uh, was, there was a pub called the Atlantic Pub. And basically, if you saw somebody walking one door of the pub and out the other door, um, within 30 seconds or a minute, you knew they'd, um, they'd bought drugs. So it's easy to justify a stop and search. And um, we um, decided to do that. But what happened was we got overtaken by a um, motorbike that was two up. And uh, the pillion, which was uh, Leroy, got off and went into the pub. And um, we didn't think a lot of it, but the bike then went off for a red light. So again, we, we're no match for a powerful motorbike. So we just went around the corner and um, then we saw the rider um, still had his crash helmet off and he, he saw us and his body language, just, it just wasn't right. He was, he was up to something. I had a Zig Zoya pistol in my waist, which I was walking with every day, and went to the pub, went inside to collect the money from my friend, saw him, got the money, then he told me that there's police in the pub as well to do what I'm doing and go. So I've come out of the pub and I've said to the person I was with, come, let's go. He started talking to some guy and I'm saying to him, let's go, brother. And then the Sierra came back round and that's when it all started. Basically, we, um, we parked up just further along um, and um, got out and we just um, said, look, we've seen you in the drugs pub. Um, there's no current keeper on the bike or something. I don't know if you've mentioned that now, but take your crash helmets off, we can search you for drugs. As we started off, it wasn't anything out of the ordinary, um, but then we get to a stage where you almost overstep that line and the whole atmosphere just completely changed. Can't, can't say what it is, it just changed. And you knew, I knew we'd gone too far and something was up. Um, but you can't, you can't re retract what you've just done. So I went to search Leroy's friend um, and my colleague went to search Leroy. And um, my, uh, the person I went to stop dropped something on the floor, which I thought was cracked. I don't know, or never will know. Um, and I went to push him against the wall to retrieve it. And as I did that, I could see in the corner of my eye that Leroy was struggling with my colleague and they were both on the floor. Um, and um, then literally, I'm gonna go and help my colleague. Okay, that, the drugs and that, that's not important. My colleague, he's important, yeah. Um, and as I went to move over, um, I saw Leroy pull a handgun out of his waist it hit my colleague uh, in the leg. Um, the shot was fired, it broke his leg. And then uh, Leroy pointed a gun at me and told me to disappear. And it's literally um, almost like slow motion. Um, you know, this isn't happening. Yeah, the alarm's gonna go off in a minute. W what do you do? And literally as I've turned and Leroy's fired a, another shot, which um, hit me about a centimetre from my spine, went through the top of my kidney and out my side. Um, and then I, um, I managed to um, find some protection by a van. And, um, um, and then the next thing is I hear another shot, which I don't know where it was fired at, at that time. And then eventually the motorbike went off and they, they, they drove off. For me, it was a case of, <clears throat> and when something traumatic happens or you get involved in something traumatic, what, what we train in the police is you've got to be positive. Yeah, I'm going to live, I'm going to live, I'm going to survive. Um, and that came through with me is that I can remember still to this day thinking, I'm not dying here. I'll die in hospital, but I'm not dying here. And um, um, that, that just sort of kicked in with me. Um, and uh, I know it did my colleague at the time as well. 
when all this unfolded, I was wanted for escaping from prison. So all I wanted to do was escape. I just wanted to escape and it was fight or flight. And I took the wrong decision to just fight, you know, no second thought or anything. It was just all fast and it just all happened. And the final shot was in the air. If I don't get away and the rest of the police come, I'm dead for sure because everyone's going to be mad as hell and I couldn't afford to get arrested in those circumstances. I'd committed myself. So that's basically what happened. At that stage of my life, I wasn't friends with no police or got any empathy for police or anything to do with how anyone felt apart from I don't want to get nicked and I'm not going in prison. So I was just making good my escape. And I had people ringing me every two minutes. You need to leave, you need to leave, you need to leave. I was turning on the telly and it's on the telly. It was just on top, do you understand? Yeah, like fully on top. And then I swapped pistols and went to a little secreted, kind of like a little out of the way ferry port and took a ferry to Holland. James, what injuries had you sustained and what, what happened to you straight after? Um, I went to uh, King's College Hospital um, and I was, there. I was in there for four days and then I had to, because they were short of beds, even in those days, I had to go back every day to have the wound dress. Um, and um, I was off work for six months. Um, and then I went back to work and I went back to Brixton and I went back onto frontline duties, which obviously they wouldn't allow you to do nowadays, but that's how it was then. And I always felt that, um, um, yeah, I had to go back and do it or I was, I'd never be able to do it. And it's one of the hardest things I've done in my life. Um, but one of the best things. Um, I, never, I never hated Leroy at the time. I knew I was in the wrong place at the wrong time or I look at it as the right place at the right time to somebody um, didn't get uh, injured or worse. You look back now and Leroy could have just fired a shot in the air and we would have disappeared, you know. Um, but, um, you know, hindsight's brilliant. And also from my point of perspective is that Leroy had the time, had the means to kill us both um, and he didn't. So, um, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it like that. And I was quite thankful and grateful that my injuries weren't as bad as what they, they could have been. And Simon's was, was worse than me, but even then it could have been worse. I escaped to Holland. I was over there for a little while. And obviously it's a different language and I never had the right connections and that. So I wanted to get back to somewhere where, where, I, could more, where I could function. So. I couldn't go back to Jamaica because I was wanted over there for something else. And they had people in America, so they are saying to me, yeah, go to America and you can link up with them. So I went to New York and then I linked up with some Jamaicans in Connecticut, in, with some Jamaicans what was in a 10 year war with some other Jamaicans, rats and cats, they called themselves. So the last person who had come down there before me he had been seen by the other side and the next day he went to the restaurant to buy something to eat and the other side saw him and slapped him straight, gone dead. And there was an X on the floor where they shot him. So that was like, that was like a, a memorial sign for, for him because that's what happened to him. And he was only in the, in the place for one day. And that's the environment that I was living in. And then basically, I had some girls come from England, they was living in my condo with me, and one of them started smoking crack in my house, and I, I'm telling her, this can't work, because the guys what I'm rolling with, they're anti-drugs, not weed, but crack. And if they think that I'm smoking crack in the house, I'm gonna become a liability, and they might decide to just 
shoot me in the back of the head and throw me in the dumpster and take my money and my jewelry and my whatever I got because <clears throat> they know I'm wanted. That's not gonna come out of that. So I warned her and then she never listened and started smoking in the house again. And basically I took her to a train line to, to basically kill her. So we got to the train line and she just knew she had to run for her life. So she come out of the car and she just run. It was a one way road. I did fire some rounds. None of them touched her and she just went straight across the road. Nothing, the traffic, nothing. It's like a miracle. She just went straight across and just disappeared. I'd never seen nothing like it. She ran straight to the police. She went straight into a hospital, screaming, screaming. And then all of the people, what she come in, into contact with, she's saying, yeah, he's a killer, he's this, he's that, he's shot two police. Once she said that, that was it, it was over. They got an FBI SWAT team and they come for me. I was in the house, wanted to get some oil. They said that me and one man should go and get the oil. So I had a Mac 11 on me. The guy had a 27 Magnum. And we've come out of the condominium. I've took a left to come out to go to the supermarket. I just saw an FBI SWAT team around the car. Don't move, motherfucker, don't move, don't move. I got you, I got you, I'm gonna blow your head off. And everything just stopped in that second. And then they took me out of the car, disarmed me, slapped me up, banged my head in the car bonnet, and yeah, reality kicked in from there. They charged me with possession of a factory situation, two key of crack, 60 key of weed, or something along them lines, and possession of a Mac 11, and other firearms and I had to uh, agree to come back to England for them charges to be dropped. So I went back to England and then I got 67 years for attempted murder on James. And then I got 14 years for armed robbery. And then I got five years for unlawful shooting. And I got two years for escaping from prison. So 67 years. But run concurrent, you do 25. And I did 17 years, three months out of it. And um, James, did, I suppose when you eventually found out that Leroy had been arrested, how did that feel? Um, all, all the time he was free, it was obviously I was, I was a little bit paranoid, always looking over my shoulder. Um, looking out for unusual cars in the street. Um, I, I couldn't really relax at all. Um, and um, yeah, it was a, a relief as well. Um, my, my view on the sentence was, yeah, he deserved it. He got what he deserved. Um, again, hindsight now, I look back and Lee always served 17 years out of 25. Uh, whereas most, most prisoners would serve about half so certainly he served, for me, I felt that he'd served his time. Um, again, that was later on in life, I felt that, that he'd, he'd, he'd served his time as, as a cat, double A and A prisoner. Um, and I, I, I did feel that for myself and everything I spoke about earlier, that, that justice had been done. The first time I got released, I, I remember coming in the garden in in uh, the hostel and seeing squirrels and all that and getting blown away, just thinking, wow, and Oyster Bus and Sainsbury's with the machine was talking to you, lots of stuff it was like unbelievable. And then I was getting lots of pocket money given to me from all, all directions. And after about three months of all of that, I started slipping back into the only things that I kind of knew. So I got arrested again for conspiracy and I was so lucky I got a not guilty on that trial and then was released again. So I'd done another two years, so that's 20 years altogether now. I said to myself, I'm going to write a book because I've got a lot of stories and a lot of things that have happened to me and I can write a book and let some young people understand what doesn't make sense for what makes sense and what's not the way from what is the way. And basically, when I wrote the book, it came out and it had a good reception. And then that started 
my transition to understanding another way of life and looking at things different and going to schools to talk to young people. And then that's how me and James would to end up being connected in real life now because James read my first book. Um, basically, I had a victim support officer all the time. Leroy was in prison, just updated me where he was, what he was doing, um, what his con some of what his conditions were. And um, she, uh, she was really, really good. And she just said that he got this book out and, you know, um, what it was called and that. And so I bought a copy and I read it. And well, I read it a couple of times and um, the thing that really stuck out for me was the honesty. You know, there was, there was no ball in it at all. It was just all, all honesty. And, you know, it's, um, it just makes you realise what a, a violent background and a violent life that Leroy was involved in, which obviously as a police officer, you have some understanding, but you don't always have the full understanding of it. And that's certainly something since I've been friends with Leroy that has really um, put that, brought that point home to me. And especially like life in prison, it's not something you really know much about as a police officer. And but now I've, you know, a lot of things that have gone on that Leroy's told me about is, um, yeah, you know, I would never have known if I'd not met him. If he does want to go make good out of his life, then I just felt that some of the best moral support he could have would be from one of his victims. Um, so I sent uh, an email to the publisher of the book who passed it on to Leroy and then we exchanged um, emails a couple of times because obviously there's a lot of distrust from both sides and rightly so. Um, and then eventually uh, we met up at um, Charing Cross Railway Station. It was an opportunity for Leroy to, to apologise. Um, and I just wanted to meet him just um, out of interest to see what he was like as a person, not as a gangster, as a person. Um, and so you have to look beyond what he was doing, what he did at the time. And um, unfortunately, in what Leroy's been involved in in his life is the true person has never really come out until now. Um, you can't show any act of kindness or weakness as a drug dealer or a gangster, because you're finished. You've got to be strong, and then you've got to be stronger and stronger and more ruthless and more ruthless. Otherwise, you, you're finished. I, I get the cynics all the time about, yeah, he's just doing it for show, he's not genuine and all that, but I can tell them he's genuine, yeah? I, I, you know, I was a police officer for 30 years, yeah, I'd be a mug if I didn't believe in what, I, what I've seen, the change that I've seen in, in Leroy. And it's not, it's not just me forgiving Leroy. Leroy's had to want to change. And the temptation for Leroy to go out there and make loads of money selling drugs is, is there now for him, yeah? And um, to not do that, is, that takes a strong, a strong person. And um, as Leroy, Leroy says, he's, he's not going that way. I've been out now for 10 years, or just over 10 years, and yeah, I've got my two dogs, and I just live a, a normal life, and I'm happy to be in that situation. And Leroy, just going back to the moment that um, James forgave you, I suppose, what did that mean to you, and, and how has that impacted your life? It's been a powerful thing, because as I said before, James is the only per the first person to ever do something like that. And even me, when I think about it, it would be hard for me to, to, to... I don't know, man. I've been through a lot of stuff. Now I'm looking at things like, because of what James has done, I would have to forgive someone if they'd done something to me, but it doesn't, it goes against the grain of what I know and what I was grown up to. So I was like shocked and humbled by it, and I still am, yeah? But it's, it's a beautiful thing, and I'm grateful. You get me? I'm grateful. What I've learned from this is, is um, showing empathy 
put myself in Leroy's shoes, the way he was brought up, his mum being murdered, uh, what his peers were like. Um, and, and I look at it and I think, could I have gone straight in those conditions if I was Leroy? And the answer is probably no. And I had the opportunities. I didn't take them, but I, I, I did make the most of, um, of opportunities later on in life when I, when I joined the police. Um, but for me, it's about understanding what other people might be going through, not just thinking about yourself. Um, and I think that that's lacking in society nowadays that we, it's all about us. It's not about, it's all about me. It's all about us. It's not about what other people, what they go through or what they might be experiencing. Um, and that's something that I've, you know, I can't say enough that young people could learn from that. We've got our own friendship, what is as good as it could be in this world, what we're living in. That's the way I look at it. And I'd, if like, if I had to put myself in arm's way, I would put myself in arm's way for him, a million percent. Because I'd feel like I would have to, because what he's done is so huge. So that's what it is for me. I remember a fella coming in the middle of the road, machine gun, do, 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 do. Bouncer's been hit straight in the head, standing next to me. I just remember all the little youngsters like standing over his body, jumping over the bar. 